about what the drought has brought is that it has united many of us to pray. Many of us are praying for rain. We're praying that God would end this drought and provide that substance that would create food and all the other things that we need behind water. You know, uh, the, the, the good thing that we've learned, the humbling thing that, man, that God is teaching us as men and women in this drought is that we can't do anything about it. It's in his control. He has all the power over it. He can speak to the wind and the rain and make it happen, but he is, he's wanting to get our attention. He wants our attention. So how is that manifesting itself? God has revealed to us that he stopped up the heavens and there's nothing we can do about it. He's exposing his, our total dependence on him. We're totally dependent on him behind this rain, right? If it doesn't rain, it could have disastrous effects on us. But like I said, sometimes God is not using this drought to harm us, but to get our attention. So now that he has us thinking about it, he doesn't necessarily use that rain or the lack of rain to get our attention, but there's some things that he wants to do in this process. For me, the drought represents some real issues. It makes me kind of think about some of my own personal experiences. And you know, storm, regardless if it's a drought or not, sometimes there's rain happening in our lives. There's storms that are going on, and through those storms, God is teaching us. There's some powerful revelations that God is teaching us in these storms. And, and like I, I was sharing, I'm, I'm going to share with you one of my favorite passages of Scripture. This passage of Scripture is one that uh, really elevated me in my walk with Christ. It happened back in the 80s, and uh, I was really going through a tremendous struggle in life. Struggle about, well, I was much like our character that I'm going to speak about, Job. Job was one of the first books that I probably really studied to really get and figure out what was going on in my life. Now, many of you said, Job, well, just like you, I, I called it Job. I said, what's the book of Job? But the fact is, it's not the book of Job, it's the book of Job. And Job was a real person. He lived in the patriarchal times of Abraham and those individuals. And even uh, he's referenced both in the Old Testament and the New. Luke, uh, Luke refer uh, makes reference to him as well as Ezekiel. So there's things that, that are explained about Job. But this particular story about Job happened to me when my life was unraveled. I was going through some tremendous times. Many of you knew I, was a, I worked at IBM. And I was uh, always involved in church to some degree. Even though at some times uh, it wasn't like I am now. I was going marginally. I was just a part of the group. I'd come to Sunday school. I'd learn a little bit. But God really wanted to get my attention. So he touched my life. Or at least things happened in my life that really caught me off guard. I started to lose everything I had acquired. I owned a lot of property in the state of California. That would make you something like Job that would make you rich, or at least you'd think you would rich. And I had houses and cars and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, it all started to go away. I was being attacked on every area of my life. Uh, even physically, I was starting to deteriorate. And I was wondering, what is God doing to me? Why am I, you know, going through this process, losing the cars that I own, the houses, that, and even my relationship was impacted with my family. And I ended up sleeping in my car. Even though I had a great job, boy, but sometimes God don't need no cloud to make it rain. Things are coming apart in my life, and it was unraveling, and I was saying, oh, God, why is this happening to me like this? I, I pray sometimes. I read the Bible every once in a while. Why is my life unraveling like this? And God just kind of just kicked back and didn't say anything. And I started to really understand it. God don't need no cloud to make it rain. I'm going to read a little bit of the story to you about Job, and I'll talk about some of the parallels as we unfold here. There was a man in the name of us, in the country of us named Job, and he was a perfect 
in integrity, a man who feared God and turned away from evil. Hey, that's some pretty good qualities, right? He wasn't out there hanging out. He was doing the right thing. He was perfect in integrity, and he's turned away from evil. So he had a he had seven sons and three daughters. Now check out his estate. He had seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five thousand yoke of oxen, five female, uh, five hundred female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the people of the east. And like I said, there was a lot of people who referenced Job because they knew he was this great guy. But what's going on with Job? Now, I've said again, Job is a real person. Even the book of James, he's referenced. The book of Ezekiel, he's referenced. So we know that this guy was a real guy. Sometimes we can get into these biblical stories and we say, they're just stories. They don't relate to us. But they do. Because God wants to impact us by these stories. Okay. And so, his sons used to make, uh, take turns having banquets in their homes. They would send invitations to their three sisters and they would eat and drink with them. Whenever a round banquet was over, Job would send for his children and purify them. Arising early in the morning, he would do burnt offerings for them all. And, and Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned, having uh, cursed God in their hearts. So Job did this as a regular practice. So he gives us a little in, some indications about child rearing here, right? He tells us how we need to do this process with raising children. So Job did the right thing. He prayed for his children. He made sure that they were right before God, even in his own eyes. So he laid sacrifices out for these kids. That's a good dad, okay? Now, one day, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And Satan asked, and the Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? He says, I've been roaming to and fro out the earth. And Satan answered him, walking around in it, trying to get a feel for it. Kind of tells you a little bit about what the scripture says. He says, Satan has access not only to heaven, but to earth as well. We need to understand that. Because this enemy, we, you know, I, I love the little pitchfork thing with the little pointed tail. But that's not the real enemy that we're dealing with. The enemy that we're dealing with is really after our soul. And so we need to really understand. I love what we said in that song about those entities that are in the realms of authority that are invisible. That was a beautiful statement because God is speaking to the spiritual realm in which he wants us to tread. See, a lot of things we see in the physical limit us. And if we're not looking beyond it in the spiritual, we are limited in our scope and even in our perception of who God is because God is a spirit. Hallelujah. Give God some praise. He's like that. Okay. So Satan said basically that the only reason why Job is hanging out with you and doing the things that he's doing is because you protect him. You build a hedge around the brother. If you would strike him where he lives, if you would take away his cars and his houses and his boats and all of his other little toys and trinkets, he'd curse you to your face and die. And and that's what would happen. And God says, oh, no, you don't know my servant Job. He's an upright guy. This guy, not only does he take care of his kids and do the right thing before them, he does the right thing before me. He treats his wife right. I mean, this guy lives well. He says, skin for skin. Check it out, God. If you let me deal with him, this is the devil talking, I will handle him and he will be all mine. Go ahead. Have it your way. So, the test is in motion. Now, going back to my own story, I was pretty much in the same position, going through this process, and I went to a friend, a good friend of mine, and I knew he was spiritual. I mean, everybody has to have a friend that they can go to and share some of the, the deep down hidden secrets that you don't want everybody to know, right? Right? I had to go to him and tell him, I said, man, I'm not really walking with the Lord like I really should. I mean, I, I, got the, I got the front going. I got the image, but I'm not really walking. He says, well, and then plus I'm losing all my stuff. He said, I didn't want to tell him that I was homeless. Pride. Didn't want to let him know that I didn't have money. Pride. Didn't want him to know that, hey, that my, my family had deserted me. Pride and arrogance, right? Something that doesn't relate to the whole kingdom of God thing. So anyway, he says, hey, I understand what you're going through, and there's something that you need to read. 
He says, you know, there's a story in the book of the Bible, and it's called the book of Job. You need to go and read that. I think it's parallel to your story. And I was like, wow. You know the sad part? I was a Christian, and I didn't, at the time, own a Bible. I didn't own one of my own. That was tough. I couldn't even tell him that in our... This friend that supposedly was the best friend I had, I couldn't even be honest with him and tell him I didn't own a Bible. He probably would have gave me one on the spot. But I went to a secular bookstore in East Ridge in San Jose, and it was called Kepler's Bookstore. I'll never forget it. I walked in, and I knocked, and I asked the guy, I says, you got a Bible? He says, hey, do we still have that Bible back there? And they said, yeah, it's still here, Revised Standard Edition. They brought it up. I bought it. I'm walking out of the store with the Bible under my arm, and who do I run into but my mother, my father, and my sister? And I'm standing in front of the store, and I say, oh, my God. And my sister says, what you got in the bag? I said, oh, nothing. She says, oh, there's something. And she snatched it out of my hand. Over she says, oh, my God, it's a Bible. And I was like, oh, God, the secret's out. And she says, she's really going crazy now because they knew I was going through a lot. And they always wanted to try to help me. My dad would pray for me. Let me pray with you. I says, I don't need prayer, Dad. I need money. <laughs> that, that's how it goes. That's, but that's the secular vision that we get when we're in trouble. We don't need God. We need money. Money is the answer. And then so storms were just starting to increase. And I could see, the you know, like in Missouri, I, I didn't know what storms looked like. But in Missouri, I could see the black clouds coming. And it, in the middle of the day at 10 o'clock, it would be pitch black dark and the street lights would come on. And all of a sudden, the storm would start to rage. The storm was raging in my life and I didn't understand it. God don't need no cloud to make it rain. I'm doing it the Missouri style. Okay. As we go down through this process, Job was sitting there and one day his sons and daughters were eating and drinking in the oldest brother's house and a messenger came and responded while the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were gazing nearby the, Sab the Sabians swooped down and took them away they struck down the servants with a sword and I alone have escaped to tell you God don't need no cloud to make it rain he was still speaking when another messenger came and, and reported lightning storm struck from heaven and it burned up the sheep and the servants and devoured them and I alone have escaped to tell you then another messenger while that one was still speaking came and he said the Chaldeans have formed three bands of raiding parties and they've taken the camels and, and they've taken them all the way and they've struck down the servants with the sword and I alone am here to tell you God don't need no cloud to make it rain. Still another was speaking, and the messenger reported, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking at the older brother's house, and suddenly a powerful wind swept from the desert and struck down the four corners of the house, and it collapsed on the young people. They all died. I alone have escaped to tell you. God don't need no cloud to make it rain. Then Job looked up and he tore his robe and shaved his head like mine. And he fell to his knees and he worshiped God, saying, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of Yahweh. Throughout all this, Job did not sin. God don't need no cloud to make it rain. I can't say that my story is parallel to Job in that sense because there's some things that, that went on that, that really crushed me. But one thing that God did do, he drove me from standing in pride to a humble piece of life where I said, God, I need you. And I don't know what I'm going to be able to do in this situation. See, everything I know that's dear to me is gone. Everything I believe in is gone. But God said, you're believing in the wrong things. He says, yeah, there's some storms in your life. But see, the beautiful thing about when you bring in a relationship with the Savior, with the risen Savior, something unique happens after a, a storm. See, the beautiful thing about 
the Christian life is that after the rain, the sun will shine again. See, and sometimes it's the S-U-N for those who don't believe in Jesus, but for us who believe in Jesus, it's the S-O-N. The sun shines its radiance in our life, and every bad situation, he can turn around and make it a good one. You know what happened to me as a result of that whole process of that Saturday afternoon in that room with my friend and him sharing the book of Job? I started to dig into the word, and the nuggets of, of, of the truth started to transform my life. They started to purify my heart in ways that Job was talking about purifying his children. My father was, one day he came to me and he says, Son, I am thankful for what God is doing in you. He says, now I can see God moving in your life. And there's some things that are going on that are transforming you. See, this is the son that I wanted to raise. This is the son that I wanted to give life to. This is the son that I knew that when you were six years old, I prayed over your life. And I knew that God had a plan for you. And so the fact is that when God says that that there's rain clouds coming in your life, the rain clouds are building blocks. Every time there's a storm, we should say, thank God for the storm. Because God, in the book of James, said, blessed are those who persevere through trials. Because trials bring home fortification. And the fact is, it has made me a man that I am today. Jesus is a lover of my soul. But God has made me a lover of men. And he has transformed my heart. And it no longer belongs to me, but it belongs to him. And so there before him, I just lay it out. I can't hold this back sometimes. I know, I know my lady says sometimes I go fast, but I can't help it because sometimes it's the spirit that's driving me to do that. So please, I'm not going to ask for forgiveness because I'm trusting God. I want you to know that sometimes the storms of life, the rain comes in our lives in the forms of the tornadoes of our children. In, in, in Kansas, they call it tornadic activity. I have some tornadic activity in my life with my own children. You, know, you say this is a man of God who loves God and does all these great things now for God, but that doesn't change the fact that I am human. We're all human. And you know what? Keep living. You're going to have a storm. There's going to be a storm, but I want to tell you that after the rain, the sun will shine again when we trust it in Jesus Christ as our Savior because he says, I work out all things for the good of those who love me and are called according to my purpose. And what I'm purposing for you right now is to transform you into a man that knows me, a man that loves me, and a man that will have the essence of the Spirit in his life. See, all of us want that. All of us want that, but sometimes we don't want the storms, but God is telling us to be able to look at a storm and be able to recognize that it is not for your destruction. It is not to tear you down, but it's to build you up and move you to the next level because we grow in the storm. We don't, we don't grow in the calm. We don't grow in those areas where, where God is not funneling or allowing things to happen because, see, what happens in these tests is God is testing our heart to trust him. He's saying, Trust me, Robert. He says, look, I'm going to tell you how sometimes God will take a storm. Eunice and I, I asked her for permission to share this because it was a very trying time in my life. But trying times brought us here, and we're grateful. We are grateful to be here. I want you all to know that. But, you know, not so long ago, in the last few years, we weren't dealing in a realm of prosperity. We weren't in this area where, where anyone would may, might want to trade places with us. We were dealing in ministry in areas where things were blowing up. When I say that, I mean people were coming to the Lord, the church was growing in some areas, but yet it was still struggling in areas as well. And then things started to happen, and one thing led to another. And at this point, I came to a realization that I had to leave my church. My mom was sick. And Eunice and I were the only person she knew in the state. And it was a difficult decision, but I had to go. I had to take care of my mom. Honor thy mother and father that thy days be long in the land the Lord your God has given you. That was a command with a purpose and a promise. And then, shortly after I closed my church, Eunice lost her job. I learned from the Beverly Hillbillies that not into not equals not. <laughs> we had no money. 
We had enough money to live for a year or two that we saved. We spent it all. Every dime. And there was a period where there was not one penny that came in our household. God don't need no cloud to make it rain. But the fact is that not one time that we ever want for food. There was not one time that we ever went out undressed. There was never a time when we ran out of gasoline to be able to go where we needed to go. There was not one time that our phones were disconnected. There was not one time that we didn't have power in our house. There was not one time that the water was off. See, the fact is, they all came close to disconnect. But the fact is, God said, I supply all your needs. Every single one of them, as it's called, according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so one of the things that happened to me during this process was that I started to pray. And I prayed and I prayed and I would pray on my knees and I would get on my knees before God. And finally God said, hey there, you haven't humbled yourself enough, brother. Let me show you how you need to do it. I would get prostrate before me and, and lay down and just tell me how much you care. And I pray that way to this day. This morning, I was on my face before the Lord saying, God, give me the message. I don't know what to say to these people. This is, what, this is your message. But God uses the storms sometimes even in our physical health. Good Friday, I'm walking around the hospital doing communion, feeling great about myself and the Lord. My blood pressure went up sky high. Unbelievable to the point that I noticed it because I was walking a little weird. Went in and had my blood pressure checked. Make a long story short, I stayed in the hospital three days, rose on Easter Sunday. <laughs> Thanks, God, for sharing that. Anyway, but the beautiful part of that is there were many of you, there were many of you that came to see me. You don't know what that did to my heart. How it encouraged me. See, God says, don't forsake the assembly of meeting together to encourage one another. That's important stuff. And he says, don't get caught up or freaked out about doing good because you will inherit the same thing if you don't give up. That's something that God has called us to do. That's a promise with a purpose. Keep doing good. So the thunder and lightning of our health issues can sometimes be those storms. And then the earthquake of a shattered relationship. Man, that can be the rain that's in our lives. But you know, the beautiful part of what God is doing is after the rain, the sun will shine again. See, as a people of God, we must be proficient in seeking the blessing within the storm. See, in the storm, there's a blessing, folks. I'm going to tell you, there's never a, a storm without blessing because God takes us all to the next level. Can you imagine Paul on Damascus Road being struck down off the stallion and he's down on the ground, he's blinded, and he's saying, oh my God, I'm killing people for Christ or for God, at least that's what he thought. But the fact was, in all that blindness and all that fasting, God says, I'm going to use you to talk to the Gentiles. That's us, most of us anyway, that's me. The fact is, God used a negative situation, a bad situation, a storm cloud to show his presence and his love for us. See, God wants us to be so entrenched in our relationship with him when the torrents of the rain come and all those things start to knock us from side to side like the storms and the wind and the bellows. One of the things he wants to do is be anchored in him. See, that's the whole thing that makes this whole thing fly. You see, Understanding that after the rain, the sun, S-O-N, for the Christian, will shine again. We know that because after Job prayed for his friends, God restored all his precious property, everything, all his possessions. So God not only blessed that last part of Job's life more than the first, but he also gave him seven sons and ten daughters, I mean, seven sons and three daughters, Ten all together. See, so the beautiful part of what God does in a storm is that he elevates us in that storm and replaces and replenishes all that was lost. See, see, the, one of the things that Christ says, I came to seek and save that what that was lost. 
He doesn't want us to put our confidence in stuff, in men, or any of that other stuff. God wants us to be totally sold out for him in confidence and faith, knowing that when things go weary, when things get bad, God knows that the people who trust in him, regardless of what happens, he's going to bring them through the fire. So, when you're in a storm, remember that there's a message in it. God's teaching us something. God wants us to know the deep and intricate secrets of his heart. God wants to deliver us in the storm because after the sun, after the storm, after the rain, the sun will shine again. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love. Lord, let your grace be on this congregation. Protect each and every one of us today during this Memorial Weekend. Lord, I ask that as you deal with each of us in those lonely places, in those desperate places, in those places where we seek to live out your truth, I pray for strengthening from the Spirit, God, to allow us to see your hand in all that we do. In Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen. Amen.